anything in addition to the Bible. The Book of Concord is a, uh, an explanation of what the Bible teaches. So it is a, a summary, it is a, uh, an explanation, um, it is not an addition to the Bible. Um, this is why we have creeds to start with. Um, creeds were developed um, not for their own uh, good, but because uh, the church needed them. Uh, the Apostles' Creed was used to uh, teach the very basics of the faith. Uh, so when the uh, Apostles' Creed was developed, it was a way of summarizing the very, very basic teachings. Hi, Josiah. Hi. <laughs> uh, the, uh, yeah, that's the same thing. Uh, oh, hey, and there's the full odds. All right. Hey. Well, hey. Rick, All right. Here? Yes. All right, so we, we are just getting started uh, with explaining you know, why, why do we have the Book of Concord in the first place. Um, the Book of Concord is not, in, it is not something that is added to the Bible. It's not like you have the Bible and then you have the Book of Concord that is um, a further revelation from God. Uh, the Book of Concord is very simply, here's what the Bible teaches, uh, and here's, here's what we believe, teach, and confess the Scripture tells us. Uh, so it's a summary of Scripture. It's an explanation of Scripture. It's not an addition to Scripture. Um, and and we, were, we just were talking about the fact that creeds were developed not for their own good, uh, but for the good of the church. Uh, so the Apostles' Creed was developed as a, a brief summary of the faith. So early Christians could say, you know, what is the Christian faith? Well, this is this is what we believe. This is it. Um, the Nicene Creed was developed in reaction to uh, some of the heresies we're going to talk about today. Actually, um, uh, Arius and, and uh, his teachings that Jesus was like God but not fully God. Um, so the Nicene Creed was developed uh, in reaction, in part, to uh, false teachings. And, and to refute those. Uh, the Athanasian Creed was then developed later on to uh, explain, uh, well, I don't know if explain is even the right word, but to confess, here's what the Bible tells us about uh, the Trinity. I'll make that clear. Uh, so the, the Bible is always uh, the basis for what we believe, teach, and confess. Uh, in fact, in the book of Concord, in the formula of Concord, it says, uh, the word of God is and should remain the sole rule and norm of all doctrine. So apart from there is no uh, revelation from God that we can go to and say, um, you know, this is what we're going to base our beliefs on. It's always the Word of God. Um, so why do we need a book like this? Well, if, um, if you simply say, I believe what the Bible teaches, um, you might have a whole lot of people that believe a whole lot of different things about what the Bible teaches. So um, an easy one to think of is baptism. The one to think of is the Lord's Supper. Um, if people, uh, you have some people that believe in the Lord's Supper, uh, it's only a symbol. Others that believe that the bread and wine is transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Um, and then uh, uh, what Lutherans believe is that the, the body and blood of Christ is there with the bread and the wine. Um well, those are, those are very different understandings. They're all based on the Bible, uh, but at some point you have to say, here's what we believe the Bible uh, actually teaches. Um, another another uh, reason to have a study of this book is because uh, false doctrine is dangerous. Uh, it can lead to um, people... Be, being condemned 
to hell because they're trusting in uh, the wrong Jesus. Uh, the Mormons, for instance, would say that they believe in Jesus, but they define Jesus in such a different way that you're not even talking about the same Jesus. Uh, so doctrine it matters in, in you know, the sense of salvation. Uh, it also matters uh, simply for people feeling unnecessary worries and burdens. Um, you know, works righteousness is an easy example of this. If somebody believes I'm going to be saved if I do all of the right things, if I uh, live the right way, do the right things, saved. But if I if I don't do as well as I can, um, then there's no salvation for me. That that person is going to be living in fear all the time. Uh, they're not going to be living in comfort, uh, the comfort that the gospel can give. Um, so it's it's a really useful thing. For, uh, for us to have a book like this that summarizes Scripture and allows us to, to study. Here's what Scripture uh, says in a fairly concise way. Um, what is the, what's the benefit for lay people to study this book? Okay, so uh, the common um, understanding for a lot of people is, hey, this is for pastors. It's good for pastors to learn this stuff, but um, or person, uh, I don't need to know all of this. Well, here is what uh, CFW Walther, he was the uh, first president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Here's what he said about it. Uh, he said, The Book of Concord should be in every Lutheran home. For the reason, or for that reason, our church should provide a good, inexpensive copy, and pastors should see to it that every home has one person isn't familiar with this book, he'll think, that old book is just for pastors. I don't have to preach. After working all day, I can't sit down and study it in the evening. Morning and evening devotions, that's enough. No, that is not enough. The Lord does not want us to remain children who are blown to and from by every wind of doctrine. Instead, he wants us to grow in knowledge so that we can teach others. Okay, so um, the idea being we want lay people to know theology really well so that they can teach others. They can help others when they're struggling. They can um, help others to understand what God's Word says. Um, a little shorter uh, explanation of to, as to why this might be an important study for you uh, is given by uh, C. Fitzsimmons Allison uh, in his book, uh, The Cruelty of Heresy. He says, theology likewise is too serious a matter to be left to the scholars. We cannot do without generals or scholars, but each of us must do our own contending and our own believing. Okay, so it's not enough to just say, well, um, you know, the pastor knows. Uh, you need to know it for yourself. All right, so how will we be approaching this study? Uh, well, I'm going to be approaching it as a pastor, not as a scholar, not as a historian, uh, but simply as a pastor. I want you to come to know and to uh, uh, be able to understand um, what it is that uh, Scripture teaches. Uh, uh, that we might get into a little bit of that when it's necessary, uh, but for the most part, it, it really won't be necessary. Um, the uh, another yeah another reason that we're going to be having this study is is so that if you have questions, you can answer or you can ask us. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer them. Um, if you have questions as we're going through, go ahead and uh, let me know and. Uh, try to uh, include those as we go through. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, um, I'm going to be presenting the theology behind this, not the history, not the, uh, uh, not, and not in an in-depth way like you might get in a seminary class. Uh, if you want to get a seminary level 
uh, study of this, um, I suggest going to seminary. Or uh, um, I think uh, Pastor Jordan Cooper does an online uh, study that you could probably audit uh, with uh, the, the, his uh, seminary that he's a part of. Um, all right. So we have this big book, uh, but what is it? Uh, there are uh, several different uh, sections that uh, are included. The first thing that's included in the Book of Concord are the three creeds, uh, the three ecumenical creeds, uh, the uh, Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, and the uh, Nicene Creed. And those are simply summaries of the Christian faith. They are things that uh, everyone in the church believes. Uh, and this is, this is nothing new. This is something that um, forever uh, has been believed in the church. Um, if you don't happen to have a copy of the Book of Concord, uh, you can buy one. They're not that expensive. Um, or go to bookofconcord.org, and the whole thing's there. Uh, you can look at it for free. You don't have to uh, don't have to buy it. You can um, you can get it um, online and have access to everything that we're going to be doing. Uh, it is a slightly older wording uh, in the translation, but still very very useful. Um, all right. So the the first three the first things in the uh, in the Book of Concord are the creeds, and that is included to show that the, the Lutheran Church is nothing new. Uh, we are not part of anything. Uh, we're not starting anything new. We're not uh, trying to begin a church. We are very simply um, confessing what the church has always uh, believed. Uh, the next thing that you have is the uh, Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession was written in uh, 1530, and it's a uh, it was written by uh, Philip Melanchthon in response to the Roman Catholics. The Roman Catholics were saying, um, you, know, "You you need to present your beliefs to us and." Uh, the Lutherans were invited to give that presentation, uh, but it was going to, and it, it is, it was done not by the scholars. It wasn't done by Luther. It was presented actually by the princes. Uh, they brought it. They brought it and, and said, "This is our faith. Uh, we are ready to even die for it." Um, and so they they drew this up to to come to the the Roman Catholics and say believe is what the church has always believed. This is um, what we find in Augustine and, and the other church fathers. What we want is for the, the Roman Catholic Church to what it um, what had been taught away from. Um, and what, that's what we're going to look at first. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, after the Augsburg Confession, you have the Apology to the Augsburg Confession. Apology in this um, sense is not used, you know, I'm sorry, this is what we believe, or something like that. Defense. Um, you, know, you, you know the word apologetics. Uh, apologetics is uh, the defense of the faith. Apology to the Augsburg Confession is the defense of presented in the Augsburg Confession uh, in response to uh, the Roman Catholic response to the Augsburg Confession. The thing that you have in the Book of Concord, the, uh, let's see, uh, the small catechism, that's the thing you're probably, at, oh no, before you get to the small catechism, you have the uh, small cold articles, uh, which was, kind of Luther's uh, confession of faith. He, he thought he might be dying, and he wanted to get 
into print. Here's what I believe is the faith uh, and, and, uh, and then the power and primacy of the Pope, which is uh, Melanchthon wrote this uh, to say, here's the problem with the papacy. Here are the issues that we have. Uh, after that, you have the uh, uh, small catechism. That's the thing you probably learn class. Following the small catechism, the large catechism. Uh, the large catechism was written by uh, Luther primarily for pastors. Today, uh, most of the pastors didn't really have any good training to understand what the Bible said. Uh, it was a way for him to train pastors so that they could then train their people and teach their people. Catechism is really, really awesome. I was thinking about starting with that. Decided we'd start with the Augsburg Confession and then get back, back to, uh, next. Uh, after the large catechism, you have the formula of Concord. Uh, and you have uh, two of those in here, actually. You have the... Uh, which is uh, the shorter version, and then you have the uh, solid, which is uh, way more in-depth. These are both really detailed um, and deal with some kind of high-level stuff, uh, predestination, education, um, third use of the law, different, different things like that. Um, and... We, we will eventually maybe, maybe get to those, but uh, those are the uh, kind of the, the last things we might get to. Uh, the, the last thing you might have included in your uh, Book of Concord is the Catalog of Testimonies. Uh, and this is a, a whole list of quotations from the early church fathers that basically uh, lay out um, here are statements from the early church that show the early church taught the exact same thing that Lutherans are teaching today. So it, it's just another way of confirming to people that this is nothing new. This is what the, the church has always been. All right. So we are going to begin uh, in the uh, Augsburg Confession. Uh, we're going to be looking at Article 1 tonight. Um, and this first class, uh, I wanted to kind of just get things, uh, a, a class under our belt because technology was going to work. We literally had an issue with that. I had to change things on the fly. Um, I'm hoping maybe Marty can uh, <laughs> help me work out some bugs with that uh, before our next uh, class. But um, Tonight, we're really just going to look at that first one, that Article 1 uh, on, uh, on God. And I'm going to go ahead and read it. Our churches teach with common consent that the decree of the Council of Nicaea about the unity of the divine essence and the three persons, it is to be believed without any doubt. God is one divine essence who is eternal without a body, without parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness. He is the maker and preserver of all things, visible and invisible. Yet there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons are of the same essence and power. Our churches use the term person as the fathers have used it. We use it to signify not a part or quality in another, subsists of itself. Our churches condemn all heresies that arose against this article, such as the Manichaeans, who assumed that there are two principles, evil. They also condemn the Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, Muslims, and all such heresies as these. Our churches also condemn the Samosatans, old and new, who contend that God is but one person. 
through sophistry, they impetuously argue the Word and the Holy Spirit are not distinct persons. They say that Word signifies a spoken Word and Spirit created in things. Okay. So um, I thought about, initially, I thought, well, okay, um, talking about this seems like kind of a basic thing. Um, it, it seems like something that you, know, you should have that in, in confirmation class. Do we have to come back to this? Well, yeah, I think it's important that we take a close look at, at this because um, if you don't have the right God, uh, well, you got a problem, and there are so many heresies that have to do with um, who God is, and so if we uh, don't address those, uh, then then we end up with with big problems. Um, the uh, the Lutherans, when they were presenting this, when they when they drew up the Augsburg Confession, they start with. Here's, uh, here's what we believe about God. Uh, and this is very much common ground with what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching at that time. The same thing the church has always taught, uh, that God is three persons and one God. Uh, but throughout the history of the church, there have been heresies that have come about to be addressed. Uh, the most famous of these is probably uh, Arius, uh, the, the Arian heresy. Uh, Arius uh, believed that God was one, God is one, uh, and that uh, Jesus could not be fully God because he's God the Son. So there, uh, according to Arius, his quote was, uh, there, there was a time when the Son was not. He believed that some, at some point into being, he has not always existed. He's not eternal. Uh, and so for him, Jesus would have been really, really, really high, really close to being like God, but never fully God. Um, and, and this became a very, very powerful in the church. And it... Uh, uh, came to a head in the fourth century. Um, they had to address it. They they had the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. They they called together about 300 bishops and they're talking through all of these different issues. They they come up with uh, the essentially what we have is the Nicene Creed today that addresses the fact that Jesus really is God, uh, and it's important that we acknowledge that He's God. Uh, because if he's not God, um, then he couldn't have been, um, his death couldn't have been fully uh, atoning. Um, and, and yet, even after that council, uh, the Arian heresy really was, was prevalent for a very long time. Again, in 381 at the Council of Constantinople, and uh, eventually the church was able to at least come minimize that, but it, it creeps up um, constantly. Uh, this isn't just some historical thing. Um, for instance, in 2014, there was a survey of evangelical Christians, uh, and the question was, was put to them, is God the Father divine than Jesus? Okay, is God the Father more divine than Jesus? The answer should be no. Jesus is God in the same sense that God the Father is God. There's not like God the Father up here and Jesus a little lower and the Holy Spirit a little lower. Uh, they are all fully God, uh, and th there's not a, a level of distinction. However, in, uh, in the survey of evangelical Christians, 22% said that God the Father is more divine than Jesus and said they weren't sure. So you're talking about 30%, 31% of, of these evangelical Christians who don't have a good answer for, 
is Jesus fully God? That, that's a problem. Um, 16% in that same survey said that Jesus was the first creature, God, and another 11% weren't sure if that was the case. That's the Arian heresy right there. Um, so these false teachings are still with us today. That's, uh, that's a big, big problem. All right, looking at the article itself. Uh, the uh, the Lutherans make note of uh, the Council of Nicaea and, and basically say, hey, yeah, that's what we believe too. And then a lot of the other language that they, they use is actually more from the Athanasian Creed than the Nicene Creed. But it's all language that the Roman Catholics would hear and they'd say, yep, yep, we, we actually have this all in common. There's not a difference. Three persons, one God. And they clarify too, our churches use the term person as the fathers have used it. In other words, not giving that word a different understanding, a different, um, uh, but we're using it in the same sense the church has always used it. Um, all right, so uh, a question is asked here. Roman Catholics still use these creeds. Yes, uh, they do. So, and, and in fact, um, these are used by most uh, churches still today. Uh, the Roman Catholics use it. Uh, Lutherans use these creeds. Uh, Anglicans. Um, uh, the, most, uh, most churches are still going to make use of the creeds, and, and they should. They should, because they're very clear summaries of what Scripture teaches. All right, and then the second part is that they, these different heresies, uh, and you'll see this throughout the Book of Concord, that uh, I'm just going to say, hey, here's what we believe, um, and if you want to believe something else, that's great. They're going to say, Here's what we believe because here's what scripture teaches. Contrary to what God's word teaches. Uh, they condemn uh, a whole host of these different uh, heresies, the, the Manichaeans. Uh, the Manichaeans were a, a, a group uh, very early, um, well, they were popular in, in St. Augustine's day. In fact, Augustine, before he became a Christian, was a uh, practicer of the, the Manichaean religion, and uh, they believed kind of in a in a not in a bad god, and that there was this competition happening. Um, it's not really important to get into the details of it. These all of these heresies really can kind of be categorized into uh, two basic categories. Uh, they're they're going to fall into either being adoptionistic. All right, and here's what that means. Uh, the adoptionistic heresies would be those that would say, here's what, uh, here's God the Father, and, and God the Son in some way is lesser than him and is, is adopted by God the Father. And so he can be called God because God the Father has adopted him, but he's not really God, like God the Father is God. The optimistic heresies uh, have in some way, shape, or form uh, have Jesus as a created being who is kind of brought into um, relationship with God or, or being considered God. Uh, the docetic heresies, uh, the, the word comes from uh, uh, Greek, uh, dakeo, uh, to seem uh, or to appear. Uh, in the Docetic heresies, the, uh, they would believe that Jesus was fully God, but he only appears to be man. He's not fully man. So in that sense, uh, you know, all of, all of the, uh, well, they, they would not have a true understanding of the Trinity. Uh, they would also not have a true understanding of the uh, of Jesus assuming the humanity uh, and 
uh, well, what is not assumed is not uh, redeemed. So if Jesus wasn't fully man, then he hasn't re fully redeemed us, and he doesn't fully understand what it's like to be man, uh, which is contrary to what the book of Hebrews tells us. Okay, so uh, the, the very first article in the Apostle, in the Augsburg Confession basically lays this out and says, the God that the church has always believed in, that's the same God we believe in. Uh, we trust in him. Uh, he is the only true God, the triune God. And we reject all of these other heresies. Don't lump us in with them. We're not a new group. We're not starting something new. We are the church that has always been. And uh, we uh, uh, believe what the church has always believed. All right. Questions at this point? Uh, if you have questions, you can type them in uh, on the left-hand side. You could also um, unmute yourself and just ask a question. That's fine, too. Yeah, Pastor, uh, uh, this is Marty. Where did some of these heresies come from? Like the one, I, I, I can't remember the first group that you said where they, they said yeah. Jesus. Well, but, uh, yeah, Arianism, um, really, it's it comes about as, um, because they, the those who adhered to it, uh, Arius in particular, um, reason was was trumping scripture. So we we kind of to talk about this as the uh, the magisterial use of reason or the ministerial use of reason. So in the magisterial use of reason reason trumps scripture and so scripture has to fit into what is rational to us in the ministerial uh use of reason we would come to scripture and say um we're going to use our rational thinking but when we can't understand something we're still going to let it stand uh, and we're going to believe it even if we can't fully understand it um and so Arius is approaching it, and he's going, okay, well, at the baptism of Jesus, uh, God the Father says, uh, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And, and the, the uh, quotation um, comes from, it, it's a play on, on uh, the, the Psalms, and it sounds very much like um, at this point Jesus is being adopted as the son of God but he hasn't been the son of God up until that point. Um, so he's, he's, uh, he's using scripture, but he's not seeing the full picture of scripture. This is part of the problem in what happens when we, when we zero in on a one, to one text in particular or a few texts here and there, and we don't look at them within the big picture of scripture. So um, that would be ignoring like, um, Colossians 1, that makes it very clear that uh, Jesus is fully God, he is eternal, he is all-powerful. Uh, it would be ignoring uh, texts like uh, John 1, 1, uh, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, but it, it was a very powerful thing because it seemed to make sense to people, right? How can God the Son eternally exist? If you are a son, doesn't there have to be a point at which you didn't exist and then came into existence? And uh, so it made a lot of sense to people, uh, which is why it was hard to deal with. It was hard to stamp out. But when you looked at scripture as a whole and when you studied what it said, it would mean, well, actually, Jesus is eternal. There is not a time when he did not exist. Uh, and uh, we, we have to give thanks for people like uh, Athanasius, who helped to stamp out that uh, false teaching. Questions? All right. Doesn't look like we have any others. Okay. Um, hopefully we, oh, maybe. All right, hopefully we are able to get things worked out a little bit better for next time. Is that Rick? It is, yes. Hey, all right. <laughs> We're just about, Good just about to close up. Uh, 
we had some technical difficulties at the start. We're going to try to get things uh, smoothed out for next time. But next time we're going to look at Article 2, uh, which deals with uh, original sin. This is a really, really important one because um, it's kind of foundational to uh, other things that come after it. Um, and, and if we understand original sin correctly, then it kind of lays the groundwork for us understanding our need for uh, justification and forgiveness and uh, the way in which God can deliver that to us. So I would ask if you're, uh, if you're able, uh, before next time, read Article 2 in the Augsburg Confession, but also read it in the Apology. Read uh, Article 2 in the uh, Apology of uh, the Augsburg Confession, because uh, that deals with some of the um, answering some of the questions that the Roman Catholics then raise. Uh, and we'll dive into that uh, next time. All right. Um, let's see here. Pastor, uh, one more quick question. Um, yeah, I got, I got a couple up here on the, that have been typed in. Okay. Um, let's see. The creeds address the triune God, so... What is the timeline when they were introduced in comparison to the Augsburg Confession? Yeah, the uh, Nicene Creed was 325 A.D., roughly. Uh, that, that it came out of the Council of Nicaea. Uh, it was really confirmed then again in 381. Um, the uh, Apostles' Creed predates that by quite a bit. Uh, we find that used in connection to baptisms in the very early days of the church. Um, and then the, uh, the Athanasian Creed... Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's uh, somewhere in the uh, 700s that that is uh, formulated. Um, and then the, the Augsburg Confession comes about in 1530. So you're talking about a long time after the creeds were developed. So it was important for the, for the Lutherans to say, this isn't new. This is what we've always believed. Uh, this is what the church has always believed and taught. Okay, Rick, you had a question? No, what me? I think it was uh, Oh, somebody else. Marty. Oh, Marty, you have a question. Maybe. Marty, you're muted. <laughs> he can't get his mute off. There. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you're, you're dealing with a dinosaur here, Pastor. Um, did, did, did the Aryans that Jesus then was propitiation for sin and that he satisfied God's uh, uh, you know, justice uh, for, to, to, to be the sacrifice for sin if they didn't think he was really truly God? Yeah. Um, they, they had to approach it from a very different way, though, uh, because if, if Jesus is not fully God, then... Um, he has to um, perform to the level of being able to be accepted in that sense. Um, so, yeah, and, and, and I haven't delved into, you know, uh, recently deeply enough to, to answer that maybe as fully as I could, but um, Arius was... Uh, um, you know, he, he, was, he was not trying to go about um, starting heresy. Nobody, nobody wakes up and says, hey, I think I'll be a heretic today. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he, he was trying to approach this from a, from a genuine uh, uh, understanding. Um, and, and so I think that's important to recognize, too, that um, people that have false teachings today, a lot of the time it's, it's not because they desire to be false teachers. Oftentimes it's because they don't know any better. Uh, there are those that do it for the money or, or whatever, but uh, oftentimes it's simply they're, they're doing what they think is best, but it's, it's, that doesn't make it good. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay. Anything else? All right. Well, hopefully next time our, uh, Recording session will go much smoother, more smoothly. Uh, I don't know if this one even got recorded, which would be fine because it was not the, the, the smoothest uh, 
presentation in the world. But uh, each time should get a little bit better because I'll know what I'm doing uh, better. And uh, uh, hopefully you will have uh, prepared some questions from your uh, reading as well. So, all right. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Everybody have a good evening and we will uh, see you soon. Thank you. See you, Pastor. Thank you.